Welcome to our uh, March meeting. Uh, as you might guess, uh, St. Patrick's Day must have been yesterday or today or something. And uh, Mike Harris was kind enough to give me a uniform. Excited. That's worthy. It's pretty crazy. Uh, a couple of years ago. So I think that's kind of neat. Uh, we have a new member today with us for the first time. He joined today. I mean, what good? So, Stephen, I'm going to throw your last name. But Stephen, sorry, right there, Stephen. Sipperlack. C I R U L A K. So, I've been a huge fan of Saber for 10 years or more and finally joined today. Glad to be here. Where have you been? We actually have four more new members. We've got uh, Angel Arroyo, uh, Ronaldo Gonzalez, Sue Jim Kim, and um, and uh, Matt Murphy, who signed up. So that's four new members. We seem to be growing, and uh, that's pretty good. Uh, I want to start off with some sad news. Got to pass it on. Uh, yesterday, Shirley Bird, Bill Bird's wife, passed. Wow. Yeah, she uh, was, as you know, she attended our meetings pretty religiously uh, in her later years, as did Bill before he passed. But uh, she was 89 years old, I think, is what Cal told me today. And a little sad that she did pass. You know, she, I don't know what the details are. Cal didn't know exactly what the details were. Okay. Good news. Here is the Mike's there. Mike Bam. Mike Bam. And y'all know or may know, Sabre has a new program where they uh, fund special projects for individual chapters up to $10,000 total. So four chapters can get involved. And uh, thanks to Mike Van and Joe, we submitted a project for their consideration uh, to put up a marker for Colt Stadium. And voila, it's been approved. Right. So we're going to get 15,000. Not only did Mike get it approved, he's already run it by city councilman and the county judge. Oh, well, give him verbal approval. Right. Mike, uh, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but he's not. Has... Good things. Mike, super job. Thank you. Yeah. So that, that was the project. And uh, of course, we hope to have another project. Uh, Mike McCoskey is working on a possible project for next year. Uh, and we'll see how that works out as far as finished baseball is concerned. So, want to let you know that uh, Sabre let some money loose. So, maybe some of our students will be coming back. And, uh, I think this project may cost about a total of $3,000, is what I've been told by Mike. So, we may need a little fundraising uh, to fill in that extra 700 bucks. But uh, it's a worthy project, and Sabre's thought it's a worthy project. So, it was approved. Joe Thompson, you know, I'm Bob around in case you don't know who I am. I've done this once once or twice. And uh, Joe Thompson is, not, is with us today. There he is. Hey, Joe, welcome back. Sure. I'm glad they let you in the country. Oh, <laughs> Thank, <It's awesome>. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Hope everybody had a good spring break. I'm literally on the DL. So thank you, Bob, for uh, filling in. Yeah. So, I decided sure. it would be a good idea to uh, fall down the mountain of the Acropolis. So I'm literally on the DL. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, yeah, we had a great time in Athens. And um, we got back yesterday. It was a long flight from Amsterdam. But uh, still feeling very uh, jet lagged. But uh, I'll be with you all next, uh, you know. I'll be back to running things next month, I guess. I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how things go. I don't know. Bob may uh doing such a great job already. <laughs> but thanks, Bob. Thank, thanks for filling in.
Miss you, Joe. We really do. Hey, Benny. Well, yes. I guess you can't take him off here. Bye, guys. Yes, just Red is not Red is live. Where are you today, Fred? Uh, I'm here at my house in West U, but I got out of work a little late today, so. I right, think for Fred Rogers, where he was. Are you across the, across the sea? Yeah, I'm in uh, Thailand. Oh. Wow. I'll do my second guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's, tomorrow, it's, there. Morning. <laughs> it's seven in the morning here. Yeah, well, this day is so bossy. <laughs> well, I have heard the pal. He's most coming. Stop. So, Scott, so we, we have a pretty good crowd all together. We got some super amazing presentations today for you. Um, the first one is going to be with from Matt from Aaron. Matt's been a long time Sabre member. Uh, he's a baseball historian. He's a computer guy. He's like several billion. He and his dad were, grew up in the North, Northeast. Uh, his dad was a uh, right at Brooklyn, the New York Giant fan. And uh, we had an interesting tour. A couple of years ago, we went to interview a Negro player, Boss Satchel. Boss Davis, I'll get it right. Well, and who would play for the Cleveland Buckeyes and the uh, Baltimore Elite Giants? And that was we went down there and talked to him, and he was rather elderly at the time. And he got his nickname Satch, he says, because he threw as hard as Satchel Baby. Should believe it, right? He had a sharp mind, too. He could recall a lot of the right smart guys. So that's got a story that he's developed that is fascinating. Uh, that I think you all will enjoy. It has to do with a riot here in Houston. It also has a baseball connotation. So, Matt, you got it. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Lots. Down goes it forward. Okay, perfect. We're going to try this. Call. It doesn't work. Run it. Uh, so, hopefully, everyone can hear me. Um, thanks for giving me time today to present that meeting. Um, my topic is a man named Roy Taylor. And the Houston race riot of 1917. And you might ask yourself, do these things have anything to do with baseball? Well, we're going to get into that. Uh, it's possible that nobody here, I'm trying the buttons. You want to try the buttons? It's possible that nobody here has ever heard of this man, Roy Taylor. Um, I wouldn't have heard of him either, except I stumbled across him a few months ago doing some Negro League research. Title. Um, and uh, anyhow, uh, what was interesting to me is you find a Wikipedia entry for him, and this is literally what it tells you. He was born in 1899, died in 1894, was a Negro League baseball player for two seasons, 25 and 26. He was a native of Olmstead, Kentucky. He was one of 112 soldiers of the U.S. Army's 24th Infantry Regiment convicted of mutiny in the Houston Race Riot in 1917. But I thought to myself, there's got to be more to this story than just a few sentences about him on Wikipedia. So I did some research. So I'm going to ask that you bear with me a little bit. Tonight's story is a little bit ambitious. Uh, some of the topics are sensitive even today. Um, and it's far from what you would think of a typical big leaguer baseball story. Okay, go ahead. Is it working now? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, to begin, I'm going to recognize the Buffalo Soldiers. <clears throat> So the Buffalo Soldiers were all black regiments of the United States Army. They first formed right after the Civil War in 1866. They helped rebuild the United States and they fought on the Western frontier all along the Western United States. And many of the Buffalo Soldiers went on to fight in the Spanish American War and the Philippine American War. And if you didn't know it, 
There is a Buffalo Soldiers National Museum here in Houston on Caroline Street. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And uh, in particular tonight, we're going to talk about the 24th Infantry Regiment, uh, who are one of the groups of Black slaves. So, in April of 1917, the United States declares war on Germany. First World War begins. As a country and as a military, we were not adequately equipped to go fight a war in Europe. The U.S. Army was mobilized and was preparing troops to fight. And for part of that process, they had to develop army camps around the country. Well, because Houston had just constructed a major port, right, Port of Houston, and had a climate that more or less was suitable to year-round operations, right, meaning we don't get heavy snow in the wintertime, it does get pretty hot in the summertime, it was chosen as the site of one of the Army camps. The camp was named Camp Logan for Union Civil War Gen General John Logan. The site of the camp was the northwest outskirts of the, of, the, of the city of Houston. The location now is largely occupied by Memorial Park, which is obviously clearly in the center of the city today, but at that time, it was on the outskirts. And as the crow flies, we're sitting here at Spaghetti Western restaurant tonight, those of us that are in person, and a mile and a half away is the site of Camp Logan. So we're pretty close to the site, but we're actually in the path that the rioters took in 1917. So it's relevant. So you have to understand that in World War I, the United States military was still segregated, meaning there were black troops and white troops in separate units. They were not combined in an integrated force. So the white Illinois National Guard was sent to train at Camp Logan. And on July the 27th of that year, 1917, the 3rd Battalion of the Black 24th Regiment, led by seven white officers, were transported by train. They came from Columbus, New Mexico. Remember, these are Western frontier type soldiers uh, to guard the camp's construction site. From the outset, the black contingent faced racial discrimination when they received passes to go into the city. The majority of the men had been raised in the South. They were familiar with the situation of segregation, but as U.S. Army servicemen, they expected to be treated better, more equally. Now, many local Houstonians, including the police, uh, streetcar conductors, public officials, viewed the presence of black soldiers as a threat to racial harmony. It's great. It was thought that if black soldiers were shown the same respect as the white soldiers, then the black residents of Houston might come to expect the same treatment, meaning they would expect to be treated well, to be given equality, and that didn't sit well with some of the residents of Houston. August 23rd started out hot and sticky. If you've ever been in Houston in August, you know that's a true statement. <laughs> An incident occurred where a white policeman was beating and arresting a black military private who tried to intervene during a violent daytime arrest of a black woman. She happened to be a, a watch once. And this occurred in the Fourth War here in Houston. So then Corporal Charles Baltimore, who is a black military policeman with the battalion, inquires about the soldier's arrest. And the corporal, for his action, gets hit on the head. He gets shot at by the police and taken down to police headquarters. He was soon released. However, a rumor quickly reached Camp Logan that he had been shot and killed. Remember, he'd been shot at. People witnessed this. While some hoped that the truth of Baltimore's life would quell 
the quickly fermenting revolt, his tale of the argument and his treatment at the hands of the police just banned the fire. A hasty plan was put together to march on the police station to free tribe of Edwards and to find two white Houston police officers responsible for the And here he was. Uh, they were, uh, the soldiers basically organized themselves and said, we're going to go march on the city. So at 8 p.m. on that night, black soldiers rushed into the supply tents in Camp Logan. They grabbed rifles. They began firing wildly in the direction of a supposed white mob. Remember, this is at night now, so can't necessarily see or understand everything. And a sergeant named Vida Henry led over 100 of these armed black soldiers toward downtown Houston. They came down. They marched. They were in organized fashion. March down Washington Avenue over the Shepherd Dam. If you didn't know it, Shepherd had a dam along it at one time because this was the edge of town. And uh, down to San Felipe Street and into the Fourth Ward. And one of the interesting things I noticed that's on this map is you come over here, Old San Felipe, and it says Old Ballpark. I believe this is the ballpark that Mike Vance and some others helped get the sign dedicated for the historical marker uh, mm -hmm. for the so it was it's interesting that that was in their path. But anyway, uh, they were going to try to free this man who had been arrested and they thought maybe he was still uh, in trouble. Well, the suspected rioters that were termed mutineers by the press got rounded up. Okay? And being in a military situation, uh, a, car, a court martial was held. In fact, there were three court martials held, and they were conducted at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. By the way, you'll notice the headline on this Houston newspaper article: "Negroes are gone, Houston is quiet." So, grand jury returns murder indictments against forty members of the twenty-fourth Infantry. Military investigated and they court martialed 157 blacks. They tried them in three separate proceedings. They were represented by a single defense counsel. I know we have a couple of attorneys here tonight. Represented by a single defense counsel who was not a professional lawyer. In his first military trial, held November of 1917, 63 soldiers were tried, 54 convicted on all charges. At sentencing, 13 were sentenced to death, and 43 received life in prison. The 13 condemned soldiers were denied any right to appeal. In fact, the very next day, they were hanged at Salado Creek, Texas, December 11, 1917. The second and third trials resulted in death sentences for an additional 16 soldiers. Well, President Woodrow Wilson kind of intervened in this. Those men were given the opportunity to appeal largely due to the negative public reaction to the first 13 unlawful executions. Among the soldiers that were given life sentences, <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep having a mistake. It's it's Roy Taylor, not Roy Tyler. The person, the focus of this presentation, he was incarcerated at age 18. He's a soldier, age 18, incarcerated at the federal penitentiary at Leavenworth, Kansas. Although he was a convict, Taylor was seen as something of a hero by the African American community. Now behind bars, Roy was setting prison records in athletics, running and jumping. Although he is very gifted athletically, he had initially avoided organized prison team sports that they had, one of which was baseball. <clears throat> now, in the background, another separate legal event, which has direct implications for our story, involves Jack Johnson, who many of you may have heard of, because he's from Galveston, Texas. <clears throat> he was the first black world heavyweight champion. He was indicted in 1912 by the U.S. government 
and charged with violating the Mann Act. If you're not familiar with Man, what the Mann Act is, says transporting a person across state lines for immoral purposes. And it was an attempt to tarnish him and discourage his interracial relationships. He had two marriages. After his first wife died, he remarried. Both spouses were white. This was not acceptable to a large part of America back then. So um, Jack Johnson's trial was held in the courtroom of another famous baseball person, in Judge Kennesaw Mount Landis. Now, this is prior to him becoming commissioner of baseball. Judge Landis, of course, makes the Baseball Hall of Fame as he's recognized after his death. Um, it's on account of Commissioner Landis that baseball's color line was perpetuated. He did, he did nothing to abolish the color line in baseball, and that's why white people had their leagues and black people had their leagues. It wasn't until after Landis' death that that changed. So Jack Johnson was a man who took orders from nobody. He resolved to live as if the color line did not exist. He battled against the bigotry of his era. After his courtroom conviction in 1913, Jack Johnson skipped bail. I thought this was amazing. He left the United States, he traveled to Canada. He posed as a member of a black big flag. And he remained on the run for seven years. In fact, this guy was so crazy. He fights a title fight in Havana, Cuba in 1915 while he's on the run from just about a <laughs> Now, he finally turns himself in and he gets sent to a federal prison, prison penitentiary at Leavenworth, Kansas. So... While he's at Love and Work, Jack Johnson says, well, I'm going to organize boxing matches because I'm a boxer. And so he puts on exhibitions, and he creates this free-for-all. They call it a battle royal. And they had five guys fight each other all in one ring. Sounds almost like a WWF wrestling match or something to me. But at the conclusion of that fight, Roy Tyler was the last man standing. Now... That led Jack Johnson selecting Roy as his personal sparring partner. Jack was preparing for an upcoming fight of his own against his namesake, the black boxer, Topeka, Topeka Jack Johnson. As an aside, this other black boxer pictured here, Topeka Jack Johnson, also played baseball for a number of teams. Chicago Union Giants, Minneapolis Keystones, Kansas City Giants, Kansas City, Missouri Royal Giants. So in 1910, this Topeka Jack Johnson even attempted to form a Negro National League. So it was an effort to try to create a professional league segregated but at the highest level of baseball. And he wrote an article which appeared in leading black newspapers, including the Freeman and the Chicago Defender. And he wrote, to my idea, it will be one of the greatest things that's ever happened for the Negro if it goes through. There is no one that knows from the actual experience better than I under what trying conditions the Negro has been existing in baseball. In other words, it has been very discouraging for the colored player. I thought this was a Interesting quote, a sad quote, but an interesting quote. So coming back to Roy Taylor, his toughness and athleticism have enabled him to survive the dangers of prison. And at this point, he began playing baseball for the prison team of Booker T. Washington, which was a black team. They were not only the best, the premier team in the penitentiary, they were one of the best teams in that whole region of Kansas. And they played at an amateur and a semi-pro level. They had all kinds of opponents, including the famous Kansas City Monarchs. And Roy made an immediate impact on the Leavenworth squad in 21. He became the team's leading hitter and base runner. He was a gifted outfielder. The prison actually had a newspaper, and the press corps in the prison specifically mentions his 
fish pull our catches in center field. The guy must have had some kind of reach. In the 1924 season, he finished with a 607 batting average. It doesn't matter to me that this is not professional ball. Anybody that can hit 607 is pretty good. So were all the games at the prison? Most of the games were at the prison. I think there were occasions that they got permission to play elsewhere. But I think they were primarily based on the prison. From, from what I've observed from the record spot. Now, the next event it's almost like something out of a Hollywood script. Remember, you got Taylor batting 609. If you are in organized baseball, that gets your attention. So Roy mysteriously gets paroled that September after the baseball season, and he gets sent into the custody of Root Foster. Foster is the founder of the Negro National League in 1920. By the way, he made the Baseball Hall of Fame in 81. And born in Calvert, Texas, and now has a marker there. And he was both a player and a team owner in the Negro Leagues. So now Taylor's kind of moving up in the world. He gets out of the penitentiary. He's playing ball for uh, Rick Foster. And it seems like the friendship that Taylor had with Jack Johnson probably led to his introduction to Foster and getting him to position with the 25 American Giants. On that team, Roy was in the company of two future baseball yeah. Hall of Famers. Willie Foster, who's a half fighter, Foster, also born in Calvert, and left fielder Cristobal Torriente, who was Hall of Fame in 2006. Roy played in the Chicago American Giants spring training, but then he only appeared in a couple of recorded games. His last recorded game is on May 5th. Well, one of the challenges on doing research into the Negro Leagues is a lack of accurate historical records. And that's simply because the, the press that covered their events was mostly the black press. They didn't always send reporters to the games. They didn't always publish every day. So the box scores and the information we have is limited. But... There's enough there that they've been able to put together pretty good records. One of the uh, things I'd like to recognize is the work of SABER, its members, its committees, for the valuable work that they have done and continue to do to recognize and publish, publicize baseball and all of its history. One of these efforts resulted in a website and a database called Seamheads. This is an in-progress statistical encyclopedia covering black professional baseball players, teams, and leagues during segregated ball. Their work has been delivered by Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred. Brian Gumbel, who hosts HBO Real Sports, has pronounced the Seamheads database to be the most authoritative record of Negro League statistics ever assembled. Even though it's authoritative and it is the best source out there, it isn't necessarily accurate. In Roy Tyler's case, he hasn't been credited yet for all of his league, Negro League games. Remember, when we last left him in 25, he just had a few appearances for the Chicago American Giants. But here's a box score showing him playing for St. Louis against Memphis. And from what we can tell, he began Hearing for the Stars on July 20th, he stayed with them through the playoffs that year. So he had a pretty pretty good season making the playoffs. If you go to Seam Hedge, you'll see uh, dates, uh, positions. He was a right fielder, and you see his batting uh, information. Now, this team, the 1925 St. Louis Stars, were managed by a guy named Candy Jim Taylor, and they also had two future Hall of Famers on their team, Willie Wells, who I believe is from San Marcos, Texas, and the legendary outfielder and base dealer, James Cool Papa Bell, which I think that's got to be one of the best nicknames in baseball. And <laughs> and the story that's told about him by his roommate is, they said Cool Papa Bell was so fast, he could flip the light switch and get back under the covers in bed before the light fell. That's what I said. 
Now, as Seam had show, in 1926, he played 26 games for the Cleveland Elites. After that, Roy Taylor joined the Fort Wayne Color Pirates, and he was a player and manager. I didn't know anything about the Fort Wayne Colored Pirates, but I did do some research and I found out that Indiana had over 37 traveling black teams. That kind of tells you this was an important activity. Now, you got to remember, there's no television, no ESPN. If you want to watch baseball, you got to go in person during the daylight to a ballpark and watch guys play baseball. Um, so to have 37 traveling teams from one state is a pretty interesting thing, especially that these are all black teams. But you got to remember, uh, people, whether they were black or white, wanted entertainment. And this was something that was available to people. Now, although he plays for the Fort Wayne Pirates and manages them, there's an incident that happens. Roy's living with a lady, and there's a white visitor at the house. And... Something turns up missing, and Roy gets implicated, in it, right? And so he gets convicted, which gets him turned into the Indiana Reformatory, which then gets him a violation on his federal parole. And so he gets sent all the way back to Leavenworth and to serve out the remainder of a life sentence. As a curiosity, the Seahawks Negro League database gives credit to Roy for a single game as a pinch hitter for Columbus Bluebirds in 1933. It seems inaccurate. Tyler is back in Leavenworth in 33. He probably isn't playing baseball against the Columbus, for the Columbus Bluebirds. But what he is doing is he's playing for the prison's now integrated baseball team, the White Sox. Oh. <clears throat> so imagine that Roy Tyler finally makes it to an integrated baseball team after having been in segregated baseball throughout his career. After a lengthy campaign by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Roy's federal sentence was commuted. Tyler was released. Taylor was released in 1936. He's one of the last of the 24th Infantry soldiers involved in 1917's Houston race riot to gain his freak. So 18, when he enters, he's one of the uh, longest serving uh, people in prison. After his release, Roy travels to Chicago. Later on, Kalamazoo, Michigan, he worked at the, as a caretaker at a Boy Scout camp. He dies in 1984. Okay? So we can see that with a little effort on my part and the part of a bunch of other people, we've been able to paint a pretty significant view now of Roy Taylor's life. So here's the epilogue. On December 16th of 2020, Major League Baseball officially recognizes seven distinct Negro Leagues as Major League. That means that 3,400 Negro League players, their statistics and records are now included as part of Major League Baseball's history. And this includes Roy Taylor's time in professional baseball. On November 12, 2023, by the way, that's only four months ago, five months ago, the U.S. Army announced it had aired in the 110 convictions and punishment of the 24th Infantry soldiers, attributing this to racism. All of the men are granted honorable discharges, including Roy Taylor. It only took 106 years to grow them. And February 22nd, 2024, by the way, that's my birthday. Yeah. Less than a month ago. Okay, so we're talking in the last 30 days. The black soldiers who were executed for the riots have now received new headstones at their place of burial, which is Fort San Houston, depicting their full information, including their birth and death dates. Previously, they had the death date. They did not have their birth date because they were considered criminals. Mm -hmm. And now it's reflective of their honorable discharges. In fact, the families are now eligible to receive benefits as family members of discharged veterans. So, 
I'll finish with this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Go ahead, Doctor. Well, it's my uh, <laughs> I did have a question. I didn't hear what you said happened. They left. They went to the police station down as well. What happened when they got there? The next thing I heard, they were being on trial. Yeah. They kind of got there. They kind of realized there was really nothing more to do. The guy leading him was Sergeant Henry, uh, Vita Henry. He thanked all the men. In fact, he personally shook the hands of every man there. And he said, return to your barrack, return to your camp. So they went back. And then Sergeant Henry actually took a gun and ended his own lives. When they, I, I think I had left some information out. When they were marching on Houston, they killed uh, four police officers. That was good. And they killed a soldier from Illinois National Guard. They mistook for a police uh, office. So, you know, it's not as if nothing happened. It's not as if we can say uh, nobody's responsible for the murder and crimes that occurred in this situation. However, uh, the, the situation with the trial was very unjust. To accuse and, and, and try so many people in, well, what amounted to three trials, but the main one was one trial, and find better than 90% of the men guilty, and to, to have an execution within 24 hours with no review, um, you know, it's one doesn't counteract the other, but it's a bad situation all right. And there, there was never by people in South Texas College of Law. To overturn these convictions. Yes. Yeah. Conducted this enormous research in the records of trial. She filed a petition with the Department of the Army. It took a while, and the Army moved slowly doing this thing right. And they, they did hold that the Fort Martin provision should be overturned. The uh, execution took place at a time of war. And so it right. was authorized with military law at that time. At that so, time, they followed the law. They did. And uh, it's just unfortunate about what West Texas is. Eventually, the army is set things straight. And it's a marked story on it. Many, many it, it is. It, it is. And, and if I had heard this story even a year ago, I would have told you as much as I knew then. But given how much has happened in just the past four or five months, it's incredible. It really elevates the story. And I think it's important to recognize that Again, this history is available to us. Fortunately, enough things have been preserved. Newspapers, documents, history, even some extended family members that we can record and recognize some of these events. Don't ask Tony when the Dr. Slofsky filed that. It was, yeah, end of NAACP sponsored it, and a bunch of lawyers got together, did a lot of research, uh, South Texas had a copy of the records of trial for Hunco, and they, they, they investigated very thoroughly. And they will make a uh, convincing case to, I think, the Army Board to question military records, ADCMR. In the 70s, 80s, 90s, like that. It's, it's taken a long time. It was a cost less back in the 20s because of the uh, well, way back then. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, yes. But it's lost here in Houston. People forgot about it. No one knew about it after the passage of so many years. So the 24th would we gather here in Washington and after the riots, they would shift back to water for a blizzard someplace like that until the trials were Um It's also of interest that uh, several other verdicts and convictions have been overturned. So we mentioned Jack Johnson being convicted of the Mann Act. Believe it or not, in 2018, he received a presidential pardon by President Donald Trump, who was a boxing fan. And the family approached him and granted him uh, that. 
And Jack Johnson, who didn't necessarily receive a lot of recognition in Galveston, now has a statue and a historical monster. He's actually on Jack Johnson Street oh, wow. in, uh, in uh, Galveston. Um, Rube Foster, when I visited Calvert in the early 2000s, there was no information at all on Rube Foster or Willie Foster, her bro his brother, both of whom from Calvert. In 2008, a Texas State Historical Monument was placed in Calvert honoring Rube Foster at a small ballpark that they've created there. And now the community is actually coming together. They're giving youth from that area, but particularly minority youth, the opportunity to play what they're calling sandlot baseball. So again, some things are changing as people are coming together. I think it's a very neat situation. So thanks so much for this to this party. Matt told me that story over the telephone or sort of portion over the telephone we were talking to Simon Sarah Reddick for tonight. Fascinating stuff. And Matt did a really good job of research. <laughs> Appreciate that very much. Good job. That's one of the guys who put together our fan fest activity several years ago. He's a very active in the staff, and we appreciate that. On this day, folks. Now let's turn the corner a little bit. Um, we're very privileged to have with us again our regular Hall of Fame broadcaster. So you don't like all that recognition. Bill Brown. Uh, Bill broke into baseball broadcasting with the Cincinnati Reds, Major League Baseball broadcaster with the Cincinnati Reds. And as a result, um, he got to know a lot of the old uh, big red machine, uh, particularly a guy who set the record for the most hits in baseball. And uh, there's a new book out that will be released later next week called Charlie Hustle, which is the start of Pete Rose. And uh, so uh, Bill got an advanced copy. And we thought it'd be fun to hear from Bill about the book and maybe any other comments he might have about Pete and his career. So Bill, it's all you. Thank you. Sure. Hey, guys. And uh, my friend here <laughs> is doing a lot of work, fortunately. Chris Chestnut, he's the guru of computers, as you know. So we have a little book trailer. Ted, now you you deserve a book trailer for your next book, right? Right, yeah. When you have a book trailer, you know you've arrived. You're going to see a trailer on this book. Thanks. Pick it up and have a roll. I trail. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. He probably didn't have the greatest arm. He wasn't the fastest runner. He probably didn't have a ton of power. But he knew how to play the game. 31,000 on their feet yelling. Against all odds, he became a star. He became a star because he worked his ass off. Right in the left side. No one plays like me. No one, no one that I ever played against was Charlie Hustle, except me. Look at Pete Run! I think it was a mindset that I have to play that way. And a fight breaks out. A fight breaks out. He throws Harold into Ray Fossey, who is slow in getting up. We identify so much with him. We imitated him. We lived and died with him. Listen to the crowd! 
But Pete always wanted to push the boundaries. It's like a slow-moving train wreck. Whoa! Uh-oh. They better grab Pete. I get tired of the cameras following me to my car, following me to the hotel. One of the game's greatest players has engaged in a variety of acts which have stained the game. And he must now live with the consequences of those acts. Why didn't he just tell the truth? Are you intrigued? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, first time I've ever seen a trailer. Have you seen one, Ted? Yeah, they, the masses want to see video now, and it really does help. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so it brings to life a lot of things that we remember from when we were fans, uh, the voices of the different people. You've heard uh, Marty Brennan, Rhett's broadcaster. You've heard Pete. I think the first voice was Larry Bola. Does anybody agree with me on that? Uh, I'm guessing. I don't know who all these voices were, but it's interesting to ponder. Uh, because there were so many thousands of people <laughs> wrapped up in this man's life and his career. And, and have any of you read any of the previous books about Pete? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would be interested in uh, any comments that you would, because I've heard the Roger Kahn book was not great. Um, some of the, I haven't read any, actually. Would you remember any of them, Bob? Yeah, I was over self-serving. Okay. Yeah, they uh, didn't want to get the stand for sticking a praying manager for your I think right. a couple of them were written before the gambling thing came. Okay. Yes. And uh, yeah, from what I've read from from some of the other reviews, they were controlled by Pete, of course. And uh, of course, we all know about his admission to gambling taking so many years. But we'll get into that anyway. It's all out there. So, uh, Keith O'Brien, uh, you've been in touch with him, Bob, correct? Or yes. Joe has, uh, is interested in speaking to our chapter. We don't know at this point when that'll be, correct? We don't have a date. So okay, we don't have a date. I'm going to be in Houston as you can make a little show here. Right. So, he'll be in Houston Tuesday, April 9th at Blue Willow Books. Does anybody know where that Memorial is? Memorial in Ashford. Okay. Mary Ashford Memorial. Still okay. Yeah. So if you want to sign a copy, that's probably where you can catch up with Mr. O'Brien. And uh, he, he, in my opinion, he has done a tremendous job on this book. You can certainly uh, form your own opinions on this one by doing longer than a good Okay, so let's start with Act One, Rise. Big Pete, who was Pete Rose's father, and his actual name was Harry Rose, but he was known as Big Pete was quite a semi-pro athlete in Cincinnati. He was the preeminent semi-pro athlete of his time. He had a job in a bank, and he was a bookkeeper for a bank. He hated his job. He had some vision problems. He had headaches when he was going over all these figures every day for his bookkeeping job. He couldn't wait to get home and play sports. And he was a great athlete by all accounts that I'm reading. Uh, he was a boxer. He played baseball. He played football. He played basketball. And he was at the horse tracks. So <laughs> I think you're starting to see some things that may filter down here. Uh, so Big Pete, then uh, when he and his wife had two daughters, they had a son. So little Pete, of course, was in his dad's footsteps and um, played all the sports. But he was very small. <laughs> so the big Pete frequented River Downs racetrack, horse track in Cincinnati. And he took little Pete with him, and little Pete just loved it. Loved the lifestyle, being around the horses, trying to figure out which one was going to win a given race. And so he was right there with his dad through through all those things. And Big Pete even turned Little Pete into a boxer. Uh, Little Pete was, was playing baseball and football, you know, wasn't standing out. He was very small. Um, and so his dad, for some reason, decided that he should box. So he got him a trainer, and they were practicing uh, some boxing drills and lessons and things of that nature. 
in an old, empty swimming pool of all places. Just, I'm, I'm trying to picture these things, you know, and I, I just don't have a picture of it. Uh, he ran into academic problems, and he said later on that uh, the only thing he ever wanted to do was play baseball. He had no other plan in life. So was not doing too well with the books, and he had to repeat his sophomore year in high school. He went to Western Hills High School, and he grew up on the west side of Cincinnati, down by River Road, and that's where the Ohio River separates Kentucky from Ohio. And so very modest uh, upbringing. Uh, but he had to repeat his sophomore year. He would not have had to do that. Uh, the school gave him an out if he had chosen to go to school for a few weeks in the summer before his sophomore year. He would have been able to stay on track, but his dad wanted him playing sports. So he repeated his sophomore year. And he was cut from the uh, high school football team when he first went out. He kept trying, finally made the team, and wound up being one of the top players on that team. And same thing in baseball. He was not very highly regarded in the beginning, just kept working and working and getting better and better, and then became a highly regarded player. Well, all he wanted to do was play Major League Baseball. So he had an uncle who was doing some scouting for the Cincinnati Reds. And uh, he was just trying with all of his might to get uh, the Reds interested enough to sign him which they finally did. Phil Seggy was running the scouting department. Phil Seggy wasn't really looking for a Pete Rose type. He wanted a big, muscular power hitter, and that's what most teams were looking for, frankly, in that day and age. Uh, but Pete was not any of those things. So <laughs> Pete's uncle convinced Phil Seggy that this guy had intangibles. He was going to turn out to be an excellent player. Phil Seggy was willing to invest $7,000 at Pete. And uh, he saw it, and he was just overjoyed to show up. Go down. Okay. And so he did show up, <coughs> Act 2, in Geneva, New York, his first pro stop. And he walked out on the field at Geneva, New York, and he saw a guy working out at his position, second base. He was not at all pleased to see that, and the guy was Tony Perez. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the odds? Yeah that these two guys are going to wind up playing together for years and years yeah. and winning world championships. But Tony later moved to third base and later moved to first base. You know the rest of the story on that. Pete wound up getting the second base job. Then the next year, he went to Tampa, Florida. And his manager there was Johnny No-Hit, double No-Hit, Vandermeer. Uh, and Johnny Vandermeer was extremely impressed with the way Pete played the game. Again, you're looking at statistics and seeing, uh, I don't know what they're looking at here, but it was just the way he approached his job, the way he played the game so hard, the way he played the win. And the next year, he went to Macon. And we got to Macon, Georgia. Uh, he had uh, another manager who was well known to you, Dave Bristol. Dave Bristol was another guy, later managed the Reds, as you know, who was extremely impressed with Pete Rose. So he was now working his way into the picture for the Reds as far as their major league club. Then he wound up surprisingly making the Cincinnati Reds in spring training of 1963, and the manager was Fred Hutchins. So that was a big shock. I have a mistake on here. Uh, he was rookie of the year in 63, not 64. So in 63, uh, he makes the club for opening day and Hutchinson takes a big leap and gives the second base starting position to Pete Rose over Blassing. Don Blassing game uh, was an established major league player. He was a friend of uh, most of the players on the team. They were really, really unhappy that that job went to Pete Rose. They didn't care for that at all. But the Reds were convinced, and Hutchinson was convinced, so they moved Blassing game off the team, and Rose was the guy. Now he begins to have success as a major league player. At first, he was unimpressive, but, you know, Rose just seemed to be the kind of guy who would excel when he got a chance to play more and more and more. 
and he had a learning curve. He could remember things. He could remember uh, patterns by pitchers who would work against him. He didn't do anything but put that in his back pocket and use it someday when he faced them again. Well, he was making $46,000 in 1967. He was not at all happy with that. Thought it was a very, very low salary. Uh, by then, the general manager was Bob Housem, who had come from St. Louis. Bob Housem was uh, very tight with player salaries, so Pete was extremely unhappy with what he was making there, but he continued to plug away. Then he won batting titles, 1967 and 68. He later won a third one, 1973. Uh, his his star continued to rise here. 1970, Sparky Anderson was hired, and Sparky Anderson was not known in Major League Baseball. He had been a coach with the San Diego Padres. The Reds really shocked the world when they hired Sparky to be the manager, but he was perfect for the Big Red Machine. And that's when it became the Big Red Machine, 1970. Well, when Sparky took over, of course, he was perfect for Pete and Johnny Bench and Tony Perez and all these other players. Uh, Pete was only making $105,000 in 1970. But that was the year of the All-Star Game at Riverfront Stadium. You may remember the Reds started that year playing at Crosley Field. They played half the season there because Riverfront Stadium was not finished. Then they moved into Riverfront halfway through the season, played the All-Star Game there. Uh, you saw the home plate collision with Ray Fossey. And Pete did not know Ray Fossey uh, until just a day before the All-Star Game. For some reason, uh, since the Reds were at home and he was thinking about, you know, meeting some of these American League players coming in that he hadn't known before, he just thought it would be a great idea to meet Sam McDowell of the Cleveland Indians, the left-handed pitcher. And, uh, of course, McDowell is a superstar. But Rose, I, I, you know, it doesn't sound like a fit here for Rose to want to be hanging out with a pitcher from the other league. But for some reason, he invited Sam McDowell and his wife over for dinner to his house, and McDowell said, it could only come with Ray Fossey and his lunch pocket. So they invited everybody in, and they were, you know, playing pool till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, having a good time, and then they played the game that night, and you saw what Rose did to Fossey that night. And it was so shocking to people... It's not so shocking that somebody would play hard in an all-star game because that's back when it mattered to the players if they did well or not. And uh, Warren Giles, when he was the president of the National League, used to come in and give a pep talk to his team before, the uh, night before the game or right before the game about beating the American League. This is what a big deal it was at that time. Now, you know, the home run derby is the biggest deal you're going to see uh, during all-star weekend. But, um, Pete? Uh, saw a chance to win that game. It was the 12th inning. He plowed over the catcher, Ray Fossey. Uh, whether he liked him from the night before or not, it didn't matter. And that wound up being uh, the thing that derailed Ray Fossey's career, you know, that Ray continued to play for years after that, but his left shoulder was ruined, and he was never really able to do anything with it after that. And, you know, uh, it, it's sad for Ray. He just passed away. He was a good friend of mine, but uh, really sad with what he went through and, and his feeling was that uh, he had left a pathway to home plate right behind him for Pete Rose to take and get in there safely. And Pete chose to bulldoze him. So that was uh, a very difficult part of uh, that night for Ray Fossey many nights after that. Now we get to the fame part. So, <laughs> uh, 1973, he's the NL MVP, so his star continues to rise. He's the MVP in the 1975 World Series. Uh, you saw the, the little episode with uh, ben, Buck Harrelson in the 73 playoffs with the Mets uh, there at second base. And I was reading in this book, it talks about how Pete, for some reason, he, he was mad at Bud Harrelson for something Bud had said about him in the newspaper. And uh, he saw his chance to get him, not not out of <laughs> pure anger for that, but because he's a competitor and because back then that's what base runners did. They took out the middle infielder in situations like that, and he took him out. And, uh, you know, they got into a fight. There you had it. But that, that wasn't the only fight Pete Rose was ever in, as you was all aware. Uh, but, you know, then in, um, in 75, that, that World Series – I can remember those games so vividly now in Boston. Uh, we had three rainouts in a row. 
there and the tension was just building and building and building during those three off days. And you had the Red Sox who hadn't won a World Series in forever. And, you know, the Reds were under a lot of pressure to win that World Series too, because uh, in 1970, they had reached the World Series, lost to Bowl. In 72, they reached the World Series, lost to Oakland in seven games. And this was a big red machine, and the players were getting a little bit older now, and the fans were thinking, we still haven't won a World Series now since 1940 around Cincinnati. It's about time these guys deliver. But they weren't delivering, and the Red Sox were an outstanding team. And, you know, they were up against uh, Louis Tion. Anybody remember the uh, – mm-hmm. what, what an incredible series he had. Did, did anybody read uh, Game 6 – that book, Game Six, about that book. Just one of the best baseball books I've ever read by Mark Frost, I believe, was the author of it. Yeah. Uh, you watched it. <laughs> you watched it, so you didn't need to read it. Bernie Carvel. <laughs> yeah, Bernie Carvel. And, you know, Bernie Carvel was former Red who came back to hit those, those big home runs against them. And then you had the Carlton Fisk home run. And <laughs> Foster throwing out Denny Doyle trying to tag a third on a very short fly ball down the left field line. And uh, Don Zimmer was a third base coach, and he's standing right there telling him, no, no, no. <laughs> and the crowd is so loud that Doyle thinks he's telling him, go, go, go. When he takes up, he's thrown out of home plate. So all of these big plays that I remember. And I remember um, during the rainouts, uh, the tension was kind of getting to the players a little bit. So um, we had another of those rainouts, and Sparky decided that they were going to work out. Enough of this sitting around the hotel. He was going to have the players get dressed, go to the ballpark, get their stuff on. Let's go work out indoors. So they found a place indoors at Tufts University of Boston. And we, I remember I was on the bus going over there to the workout, and uh, the bus driver got lost. He didn't know where Tufts University was. <laughs> no idea. And so all these guys in uniform, you know, I'll never forget the sight of Sparky Anderson getting off that bus because he's in the first seat there. The guy pulls into a gas station, one of those little white Adobe <laughs> gas stations in Boston, you know, and Sparky's walking across the parking lot and his spikes <laughs> and his uniform. To ask directions of the gas station attendant at Tufts University is hilarious. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious. <laughs> but uh, the, the plays in that World Series, the drama of that thing, incredible. And that book, Game Six, uh, points up the uh, status of Louis Tion being from Cuba. And uh, there's an effort to get his player uh, to get his parents back in the United States to see this World Series. They couldn't get them out of Cuba. They had to somehow work with immigration to get visas and it was it was very interesting congressmen were involved it was a really really interesting time and i thought that the tension of the nation was really caught up in that 1975 world series so game six fist wins it now they got a game seven and pete sees that sparky is pretty unhappy about losing game six and, and there were quotes from Pete all over the place about going to home plate, and the extra innings, and, and saying to Carlton Fisk, man, this game is really something. This is really a game, you know. And I, no one says that for anything, right? But, <laughs> but Pete did. He, he was just loving the competition, and uh, this is what he did. He excelled when the times got most important, usually. And so, game seven, 1975. Bill Lee, the spaceman, is on the mound. He has a three to nothing lead. And it's looking really bad for the Cincinnati Reds winning this World Series. Pete Rhodes is on first base. There's a double play ball. He slams into Denny Doyle at second, trying to get that relay on first, forces a wild throw. That leads to a Tony Perez three run homer that ties the game. The Reds win a 4 3 on a little single by Joe Morgan. And uh, Rose was the MVP of the World Series. And, you know, you, you don't see things like Rose's slide in any box score. You saw it again, but that statistically, that doesn't go down. Uh, the people who voted for MVP award in 1975 World Series certainly remembered it. But uh, that was a big, big play in that. So all those hits, 
great OPS, 17 time all star, five different positions. You know, th these are things that, that Pete Rose was right. He was accurate in what he said. It sounded arrogant on the little trailer, but nobody was like me. <laughs> nobody was. Then we have Rule 21D. You're wondering who in the heck is Al Esselman? Al Esselman was a bookie. Yeah, and uh, this is where it really gets sad to go into all this stuff. But uh, Al Esselman lived in the Western Hills area of Cincinnati. Pete got to know him, hung out with him constantly, would spend hours and hours listening to Al Esselman talk about his sports. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think we all know gambling is a disease. So how do you how do you cure it? You go to Gamblers Anonymous. Some people do. Some people never cure it. And from, from the way this book portrays, he did make an attempt. You know, I think one time or twice went to Gamblers Anonymous. He didn't think his problem was that bad. He just didn't. So he, you know, he, he grew up in this culture. And you go to the track, you make your bets. Hopefully, your horse wins. That kind of thing. And then, as we know, uh, what happens when uh, things progress? So you, you hang out with these people, and you become financially beholden to them. And then sometimes you don't pay your bills on time, and there's trouble. And that all that was developing in his life. So then he, he kind of exhausted his situation with the Reds. Free agency was here. Uh, he wanted to make bigger money than the Reds were offering. Uh, he moved on as a free agent to the Phillies. Um, met a lady named Terry Rubio, had a baby with her, got a divorce. Met a guy named Tommy Giosa, who was just a, he was just a runner for Pete. He, he would do any kind of odd job for Pete when he was a young guy who wanted to play ball. He got him tryouts at major league organizations, and he never got a career out of it, but Pete helped the kid a little bit, and then Tommy ran some bets for him and things of that nature. Now, in 1980, he pays off big for the Phillies by helping them to the NLCS. Remember that one against Houston? He hit 400. Uh, he drew a walk against Nolan Ryan in that final game to uh, load the bases when they were rallying to take the lead. And, uh, and the 1980 World Series, of course, went on to do the same thing again, and they were they were champions. Phillies hadn't won, uh, so that was a big hurdle for them. And um, in that one, he caught that pop up. You remember that Bob Boone failed to catch. Uh, the Phillies had a uh, three run lead ninth inning, but uh, bases were loaded. So Boone went over by the dugout, and the ball popped out of his mitt, and Rose was right there to catch it. And it's one of the few catches I've ever seen like that. And that was the second out of the end. So it's a very big play in that game. So all is celebration in Philadelphia, but they don't keep it because now he, you know, is again, a free agent, and he gets a better deal for Montreal. He goes to Montreal as a free agent. Uh, things aren't going out well for Montreal in 84. And now uh, the Reds have brought Bob Housen back to run show again, taking him out of retirement. And so he trades to get Rose back as player manager to Cincinnati. And then Pete, of course, broke Ty Cobb's record, 1985. Here are some of the bookies he was involved with. Dick Skinner, Ron Peters, Dick Berlini, Paul Jansen. You don't know any of them. They're, I mean, you might have seen their names because it came out. In some, some publicity, some court proceedings. Um, then 1986, he did 219 at age 45. He saw the clip from the president, A. Martin Giamatti, the commissioner. Okay, Paul Fry was arrested, cooperating with the FBI. Things started coming out. There was an investigation that MLB had to do because Sports Illustrated found out a lot of these details and went to the commissioner of baseball, Peter Uberoff, at the time. And so they started investigating. Uh, in 1988, the 
Reds had uh, Murray Cook as their general manager. They, they had a good team. They had uh, Barry Larkin, Chris Slabo, Eric Davis, Paul O'Neill, Tom Browning, you name it. Um, so, you know, now you have Pete Rose signing autographs daily, Mandalay Bay, <laughs> and these other places. And he's in his 80s now, and you know, I, I read in the book that he felt that uh, what happened with, uh, uh, you know, his ineligibility now to be voted on for the Hall of Fame, and, uh, career got cut short as far as managing, uh, might have cost him a million dollars. It's it's a sad story, sad story. But the question I would like to ask all of you is, how many of you think he should be in the Hall of Fame? Okay. Okay. And, you know, I hear that from a lot of people. And I called Tal Smith today because I knew Tal wasn't going to be able to use. He was on the run all day today. I knew he wasn't going to be able to make it. But I um, wanted to get his thoughts. And his thoughts are kind of similar to mine, not that they mean anything, but I've, I've heard this from more and more people in recent years, like Bob Costas, people who are, you know, closely associated with the Hall of Fame, uh, talk to a lot of Hall of Fame voters, and as you know, the writers are the ones who, who vote, but they haven't voted on Pete because there was a Hall of Fame committee formed that... Uh, did some investigation and decided that he should be ineligible. And so he's not eligible to be voted on the Hall of Fame as of now. And I don't know that that's ever changed. I, you know, the Hall of Fame is just a very interesting institution. And uh, in many ways, you know, is operating in the last century, shall we say. In other ways, it's very modern. Uh, but Tal and I are both thinking, and I think Costas has said this publicly, look, okay, he, he violated Rule 22. We know what he did, we think. Uh, we know what the steroids guys did, we think. And I don't know, for some reason, now that we've been around baseball so long and we care about it, we talk to people who... They want to see these guys at Cooperstown when they go there, right? Fans want to see the best players in the game. So we think that there might be a way to uh, put a line or two on someone's plaque. They violated, you know, real and game, violated use of steroids, whatever it might be. That's what these, are, yeah, and ask for that. But they are in the Hall of Fame. Do you, when you go now to Cooperstown, do you see more stuff on the rows in the hall? Oh, there's a picture so of Sam Pong. Yeah. Then you see a Joe DiMaggio. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It is. It is. So, you know, I mean, yes, you know he's a flawed character, aren't we all? Um, I'm not necessarily an advocate for him. Uh, I think this book is very fair. This book just lays it out for you. To make your own determination. These are the facts. This is what happens. Uh, but yet, on the other hand, I don't, you know, as Tal said, you know, I can't imagine that Barry Bonds is, is not. But yeah, you know, I mean, when you watch these guys play, <laughs> you're wondering how in the world has this not happened? It, it's because of moral issues. And it's the whole thing. Fame. It's not the whole morality. So I've kind of changed my thinking. But I do know that, that many Hall of Famers would say, don't ever let them. We follow the rules. They didn't. There should be standard of conduct. We all knew what it was. Isn't it crazy? Now, the Hall of Fame is supposed to be the best of the best. It does not have the all time hits leader or the all time home run leader. That's going to be. Very much it. So it's really not the best. That's very much it. So here, I, I just copied a couple things down. Joe Morgan said, Pete played the game always for keeps. Every game was the seventh game of the World Series. He had this unbelievable capacity to literally roar through 162 games, 
as if each one was that single game. And Vince Scully, when he was doing play-by-play, -play, said, uh, Rose just beat out another walk. <laughs> <laughs> Only Vince Scully could do that. But, uh, no, I mean, we have all these um, these acknowledgments that he was a one-of-a-kind player. And he certainly was. Uh, I was extremely disappointed when I found out he had bet on baseball. I knew Cincinnati, we all knew he was betting on the other sports. No problem with that, but shocked that he would bet on baseball. And uh, John Dowd, the man who investigated him for Major League Baseball, is quoted in this book. This is one of the good interviews that the author did. And he said, yeah, we're, we're almost sure he bet against the Reds time to time. And it was interesting that there were several games. Apparently, he didn't like to bet on the Reds when Bill Gullick was pitching. <laughs> And there were a few Mario Soto games he didn't bet on either. But, you know, but he, he claimed that, of course, he only bet on the Reds to win. Uh, but as we all know as well, um, let's say you have this affinity to bet and you're a manager of the team and you're going to bet uh, four times this week because typically you might bet 15 times in a day on different sports contests. And it's just a thing that you do. And, uh, Okay, I'm going to bet today. I'm not going to bet tomorrow. Why isn't he betting tomorrow? <laughs> you know? And if he doesn't bet tomorrow, when tomorrow comes, is he going to save his best relievers for the next day when he might bet? So just the fact that someone does not bet against his team does not necessarily let him off the hook for violating the integrity of the game. It doesn't. Robbie, you knew Paul Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things Fossey told me, and he probably talked to you about, is the night before didn't go down, in, at least the way Ray recounts it, nearly the way. Okay. That, you know, you've heard that story, correct? No, tell me. What, what Ray said, Ray Fossey got engaged right before the season. Okay. And, and so they went and got married because he finally made the major OT. He went with his wife. Was they're going to have their honeymoon over the All Star break? Oh, okay. So they end up taking their All Star, the All Star break in Cincinnati to go do this. Okay. So we went to dinner at Pete's house, but we were out of there because it's my honeymoon. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> so he has no reason no. to lie about that. And, and so, so it's, it's inconsistencies like that. Yeah. Always, but right. Yeah, and there there are many lies. Brown, you were a young broadcaster there in the seventies. How did he treat you? So great, and uh, great. And how do you how did you get along with his teammates? He, Everything he, I've heard is that that he, he was beloved. By he him. was he, now, uh, and the author gets into this, and he's accurate in doing so. There was a definite rivalry between Bench and Rose, no doubt about that. But uh, that's common. It's that is not anything anybody wouldn't expect. Uh, they had a they had a car dealership together, but they also had you know, some rivalries on different things. And um, yet, you know, the guy who I think I've always been told by those in that clubhouse who deserves the credit for keeping all those egos together, and Joe Morgan was one of them too. He had a very healthy ego, was Tony Perez. <laughs> Tony Perez would walk in that clubhouse and start ripping on different guys, and they'd all get it. They would all catch it from Tony Perez. Nobody was above it. So uh, he, he just brought everybody down to that level of, hey, just put that aside. But I, I must say, you know, Pete Rose put it in. With all the things he had going on in his life, it is just hard for me to imagine that when he was under the most pressure, that was in some of his best times for performing. Uh, I brought. I forgot to bring up the 44-game hitting streak because we did several TV games on that. I, I will never forget, and I'm glad the author went into this, when the Braves stopped his 44-game hitting streak. Uh, Gene Garber was the relief pitcher. Larry McWilliams was the star. He was a, a slender left-hander, didn't throw very hard. First time up, Pete hit a bullet that McWilliams caught right here, just an absolute seed. And uh, you figured, you know, 44 games, he's going to run out of luck here, right? And so he did on that. And then Garber struck him out. And Garber was a, a change-up master who was a closer. It didn't, didn't throw hard at all. But Pete got so mad 
after the game, and you know, there, there's this entourage of media following him everywhere. We went to New York and he broke Tommy Holmes' record. You know, nobody even knows who Tommy Holmes was, but he, he was, I mean, everybody knew DiMaggio's street, but nobody knew who the National League street belonged to. So Tommy Holmes was there on the field. And, you know, I remember Kiner, Ralph Kiner did his, uh, Kiner's Corner did his TV show with Pete after the game. And I was even in there for that uh, because we were taking part of it, taking it back to Cincinnati. It was a huge deal. That, that 44 game hitting streak. We went to the, um, I got in on this. I got invited to go to his trip to the White House, which was honored by Jimmy Carter for that hitting streak. And you would have thought he would have been elected to public office then. I mean, every congressman from Ohio going up to him. Uh, it was it was just an incredible time. But he, he refused to give credit to Gene Garber. He criticized him. He said, he's pitching like it's the seventh game of the World Series. Well, yeah, and you don't play that way? <laughs> it was just really unfair of him to call out Gene Garber because he got him out and then to the take Yeah, he got him out with his best pitch to change up. I said he should have thrown me something else to try to be hitting. Yeah, yeah, right. Throw me his best pitch. Oh, right. That you know that when I was reading over that again, I thought, yeah, I've read all this stuff before, and I just I, I continue to shake my head. That is so out of character for Pete Rose. You know, it really was. He he didn't go out of his way to credit people on the other team, but he didn't criticize them to that extent either. Right, you said something about he has bets. Gambling debts, I assume is what we're referring to. Mm -hmm. Do you think some debts causes that you come gambling to try to get back anything? Yeah. Um, yeah. He just couldn't speak against any metal. What? No, and he would, he would pay that. You know, he owed this one bookie 40000 He paid him ten. And I said, no, that's not going to do it. And, you know, I'm going to go to the authority. You know, he just, he just always believed that he was never going to get in trouble. For some reason, he always believed. And he didn't think he had to pay... And so several times he had to get a different bookie in a different state to take his bets because they wouldn't take his money anymore in Cincinnati or wherever it was he was betting because it was too far in arrears of, of payments. You know, I mean, it's a wonder. I, I was reading this and I was thinking about, you know, it's a wonder they didn't break his leg or something. <laughs> Honestly, you, you, you're hanging out with a tough crowd when you don't pay your bets to a bookie. Yeah, I've heard a bookie on, on the radio one day say, what do you do if people don't pay? And he says, Oh, they're gonna pay. And that was just and the way it was so cold, it was like, oh my god, you get with this guy, you are gonna pay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I think he's wealthy now. Um, I, I read in the book and, and he he cut off the author after about 20 hours of interviews because he said you're going into a black place for me now. So he could see where the book was going. I'm sure all the childhood stuff was great and all that, but when he could see exactly where this thing was going. He didn't want to go there. And so he quit talking to the author, but um, he did, you know, make that statement. So it's interesting. Yeah. Tony. I was wondering if he's going to throw out the first ball at the Las Vegas. This morning, he wrote to you, Mighty Heart. Yeah. And then, yeah. This remarkable human being, so anyway, died shortly after. Yeah, yeah, he did. And uh, the author does a great job of that, too. And he said, you know, they did all this. This guy did so much research. You know, Ted, what these guys do. But uh, he, they checked into, well, no, he, you know, after he died, talked to his doctors. <laughs> oh, he'd been having heart problems a while there he has you know so yeah, yeah. oh yeah smoking sure uh, <laughs> but uh cigarettes yeah yeah Chiamatti was a, but yeah everybody seemed to love him from everything i read and he was, he was a poet and he was a university president and all these things his son is an actor did he it's paul Giamatti. oh paul Giamatti, right right oh. but then apparently uh after he had been national league president for several months he said to uh Faye Vincent, who's the one who was promoting his career, you got to get me out of here. Oh, yeah. he, he didn't want to be commissioner. He did not want that job. He took it, but he didn't want it. And uh, no, Rose was not supposed to. 
No. But uh, the, the, yes. the story of how he got a nickname is interesting. In spring training, he, he gets a home or Mantle's up. Mantle hits full run, 40 feet over the fence. And Rose jumps up, thinking he's going to get it. It's way over his head. <laughs> Mantle comes back into the dugout, and Whitey Ford says, You see Charlie Hustle out there jumping up after the ball? Yeah. And that's how he got the name. And Rose liked it. Yeah. Rose liked the name. Yeah, I forgot to say that. But uh, also, they, according to this book, um, it was, you know, he he butted in a spring training game against the Yankees for a hit. Man, <laughs> uh, come on. Charlie Hustle here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he did. He liked he liked that name. Well, Mal was funny. Pop Pop said, if I hit my sheet rose, I'd wear a dress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if I did a single one, yeah. so, so. yeah. Uh, Johnny Bench was an interesting guy. He was he was a superstar. Who uh, what's he? I think he's engaged again now. So I think I think he, I think he's going to be on number four. Uh, but uh, no, just uh, I think the best catcher probably of all time. Um, you'd have to prove it, and I couldn't really prove it with the Bill Dickies of the world that I didn't see. Uh, but. Um, to me, you know, with the power that he had and the ability to lead a pitching staff and, you know, the clutch hitting and then this one handed style that he pioneered, you know, he would he'd take a throw like a second baseman. If a runner was coming into home plate, he'd set up like a second baseman for a tag and he'd catch it like this and snap the tag. Or if they tried to slam into him. I saw Dave Kingman go into him one time. Bounce up. King, yeah, he just bench standing right here, and Kingman just he didn't he didn't progress any further. The bench had left him. He stopped like running into that wall there. Uh, Scipio, you know Scipio. Yeah. I saw him tear up his knee sliding into bench one time, trying to score for second. Uh, he was immovable. Uh, but now you know, and then the story I like to tell about him was a. Uh, Sparky was uh, trying to plot out his uh, playing schedule for the players. So Bench was asking him one year about uh, June or so. He said, uh, Sparky, when am I going to get a day off? He said, well, we're playing the Dodgers this weekend. And then we go to San Francisco. But then after that, we got New York coming in. And then, and then after that, he said, so I'm not getting a day off, am I? He said, no. <laughs> No, Bench was a uh, fantastic, fantastic player. Yeah, nice guy. He was. Yeah, we were we were lucky. Um, you know, all those guys, I mean, they knew they were on this great team, but Cincinnati being a small market, you know, they really depended on the players to interact with the fans. And uh John, yeah, Johnny had his own TV show. He was he was a star. Here we meet the uh, woman who became governor of the Reds. Yeah, Marsha. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I saw her act one time. She was, uh, you know, Shotzi, her dog, but yeah. uh, St. Bernard. And uh, she'd go down to the base of the elevator and media would be waiting around. She, she'd kick it like this, kick the elevator to signal the elevator operator to come down and get her. No matter where he is, he's to come down there and get her immediately and take her up to the state. Years. She had the team. Um, see, she when I got there in '72, she owned about five percent of the team. I think it was around uh, eighty-six or a, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. When she bought the team, then she was a Buick dealer, and she did her own TV commercials. Oh, boy. <laughs> they were pretty rough. That's <laughs> He didn't want to cross her. No, <laughs> Do you have any uh, Don Gullet stories? Uh, you know, Don Gullet never said anything. He, he he was the worst interview. He was the nicest guy, but you know, for an interviewer, and uh, he scored twelve touchdowns in a game in high school. Nobody believes this. He he was from a little town in Kentucky. Oh, he was a tremendous athlete. Great, great guy. 
John Morgan was a good guy. Uh, what happened was that um, I think he was mismanaged here in Houston. Uh, yeah, and then uh, racist manager. Yes, yes. Don Wilson didn't get along with him. Yeah, and then when Joe got to Cincinnati, all that went away, and uh, he he just was surrounded by really good players, so he didn't have to try to do it. Very good under Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But he, but see, when they, they hit him second, you know, so Rose would, would get on and that would give Morgan that hole at first base with the first baseman holding the runner. And yeah, he, he'd bang it through the right field side and Rose would get to third base. And now, you know, now you've got to figure out. But, you know, he was the MVP of the league in, in 75, 76. He's an incredible, incredible player. And what I remember, too, about him defensively was that he did not have a strong arm. But he and Dave Concepcion worked as well together as any two I've seen. There have been a lot of really good double play combinations down through the years, so they, they'd give you a run for your money. But when they hit it to Morgan's backhand side, he'd go up the middle and get it right out of his glove and flip it. And Concepcion would be coming over from shortstop, he'd take it and throw it for his base. It's just really quick, very quick double play in exchange. How did, how did Pete feel about changing positions all the time? You know, he he never complained. Never complained. I remember, in, in, so in 75, the Reds were supposed to win it all. They were not doing well. Their opening day third baseman was John Vukovic. His career won something hitter. And uh, I, Sparky pinch hit for him opening day with the bases loaded. Remember that. <laughs> that shows you his lack of confidence in Booker. They get to early May. They're not doing well. Sparky goes up to Pete. He says, uh, I know you can play over there, pointing to first base. Of course, he was the left fielder at this time. But can you play over there, pointing to third base? He goes, well, if you want me to, I'll start taking ground balls there today. He just he didn't say anything. So he moved from left field to third base. At age, I don't know, 30, 31 or 2, I guess. And, you know, a lot of guys, been all-stars, would have said, no, stay where I am. You solved that problem with somebody else. He's fine. I put George Foster in left field. Foster started hitting home runs. That team took off. And he was okay defensively. Right. Okay. But he worked every day. He was over there. That's why anybody who was ever around him and saw how hard he worked was just incredibly impressed by that. Work ethic. Was he harder? I mean, Bijou had to make a lot of effort to go to second. Mm -hmm. Was that was Bijou close to what he was doing as, as far as putting the effort? In? They, yeah, he was. Correct. He was. I mean, they yeah, both have to be. They both worked tirelessly. Yeah, I think the catcher to second is a tougher. You know, because Pete had played second, he at least you know he knew knew what his responsibilities were on ground. But his arm was not strong, but he got rid of it. He was pretty accurate, and he got rid of it pretty quick. Yeah, he made some good plays. Um, but that team hit. I mean, they just had to find a way to get all the bats in the lineup and make that work. Mm -hmm. They did. But look at his credit. He did a pretty good job in his role as major league. Oh, was he in that? No, no, that was that was Pete Vukovic. Pete Vukovic. You had Vukovic. You had the pitcher playing a hitter. And then you had the hitter playing the pitcher. Yeah, yeah. In the in, in the in the game, so it's uh, Jaeger was out there as the pitcher. And yeah, he was obviously. Yeah. yeah. God, no wonder hey, Bob Tom. Right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, um, as some of you know, I put out a notice about uh, we were trying to get Carl Erskine, the former Brooklyn Dodger, to be on Zoom with us. He's like 97, 98, something like that. Mike made a contact with his son, and Carl agreed to come 
to us by Zoom. And uh, so we're trying to firm it up, and Mike called his son, and he said, Carl agrees to everything. <laughs> so I said, I don't think he's going to show up. Uh, he's mentally sharp, but physically he's kind of, kind of trouble. So we had to kind of pass on that. We'd love to have had him. I saw Carl Erskine pitch when I, I had the uh, Everest Field and the Polar Grounds. they have been a great guest. I so, think he's the doctor in the moment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, his arm's still hurt. He said, "Yeah." <laughs> yeah the only picture I ever saw was from overhand. Everything was overhand, not side arm, not three quarters, overhand. So I, we wanted to try to uh, fill his spot, and I asked Mike to see if he, what he could work, work something out, and he did. He found a documentary on uh, uh, Mike Beck. Uh, so some of us saw at the convention last year who was an outstanding speaker. But the documentary is an hour and a half, and we felt like that was a little bit too long. We asked Chris to see if he could manipulate it a little bit, and that didn't work out. So uh, I can say a few words. You know, in a few minutes, you will. Uh, <laughs> he always does. <laughs> he promises to be in uh, next, I'd like to have her come up and talk to us a little about our annual contest. Uh, the Astros win contest season starts next week. So, well, we've had a contest here for the last 10 years. We'll let her, who is the champion of the contest, come kind of visit with us a little bit. Please. Well, I don't know what Bill Brown does. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about, champion is not this Uh Anyway, we're going to do it again this year. Uh, the deadline to sit, get your entries in is going to be 3.10 p.m. on the 28th, which is the first, should be the first pitch uh, for the Astros Yankees game on the 28th of March. Uh, you can get the your picks to me two different ways. You can do it tonight if you want. This, can write it out, do it, or you can send an email to me. Uh, I'll probably post the email address again, but I'll go ahead and give it to you now if you'd like. It's going to be HC, last name W H A L L E Y, at SPCglobal.net. So, and the, the be three it's things here. it's HC, W H A L L E Y at sbcglobal.net. And there'll be three things free to pick. Uh, of course, the Astros total wins for 2024. Tiebreakers this year will be Kyle Tucker, how many home runs he's going to hit this year. And the other one will be how many base hits Jose Altuve. Has. So there'll be three things that you need to provide to me, mainly your name and then those other three items. Uh, and I'll keep track of all that, and at the end of the year, we'll announce the winner. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. In the you will put out everybody's projection, right? So we'll know it in advance. Uh, so I don't know if I can change their, their number. <laughs> well, I'll definitely at least get it to Joe. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So great. Total wins, regular season? Regular season only. Right, yes. Uh, I think we had one person do it just slightly late last year. We let him go, but... Uh, Try, try to follow the rules and do it by the first uh, game on the 28th. How about how many wins for the color piece? <laughs> <laughs> well, how many innings? Yeah, uh, 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 I thought since we were planning a trip for uh, Opus Christi, that maybe we would use that as a tiebreaker, how many wins they have. But uh, uh, Joe decided we have the other two tiebreakers. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Good. Hey, my friend. Hey, Bob. Yeah. Blake Snell just signed with the Giants. Really? Two years, $62 million. Is that all? Shoot. Jim Crane. Jim Crane's not a tool. Hey, he, uh, <laughs> hey, no. hey, Bob, he has a he has an opt-out after uh, 2024. Okay. Hey, well, yeah. Hold on yeah. a second. Uh, Blake yeah. Snell has an opt out after 2024, so he technically, okay. I mean, that's what I'm getting. 
one year. That he can opt out of his contract oh. after one year. Okay, so. Well, okay. Uh, last year, our chapter started a fantasy baseball league. And we had, I think, what, 13, 14 people who participated. And we've had about 10 so far who said they want to do it again this year. So we have a new commissioner, Bob McCann, turned the commissioner over to Pat. And Pat, you want to talk about it for a minute, please? Yeah, so we run the uh, Fantasy League through the ESPN app. Um, anyone can join Super Low Stakes. It's fun. Um, we're going to do the draft uh, this upcoming Sunday night. Uh, at seven o'clock, and we're going to do a mock draft Thursday night. Um, if you're interested, just let me know. Uh, or you can send me an email. My email is uh, ppeg89 at gmail.com. I'm part of it. Yeah. 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 And then um, we'll have an optional uh, Zoom link that I'll send out on an email to everyone during the draft if you want to join, join through that as well. So. If you're interested, just let me know. Yeah, that was fun last year. My first time ever doing that. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, if you want to get Carl Erskine, it's nice. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Herb mentioned the fact that we're talking about having a, a field trip the Corpus Christi. So, Mike, would you care to talk to us a little bit about the field trip? Well, Joe out there, Mike was talking about it. This idea, but we were going to do it. Uh, let's see, is it Memorial Day in September or is that Labor, Labor Day? Labor Day. Labor Day week, because there uh, there was a good reason for that. I forget what it was. <laughs> <laughs> you and I went through a bunch of things. He said that would be the perfect weekend. He oh, wants to take his family there. We had tried to do this a few years ago and, and rent a bus, but we couldn't get enough people interested in taking a bus to the game. Uh, so we could still do that. I think it was about $100. But we looked at the same their version of the disparity suite at the hooks field where it's air conditioned and you get the meal and the tickets were $68 uh, for the game and the meal. And, uh, is there a tour, Joe? You remember? Uh, no, but uh, I'm, I'm working when, when uh, we get closer and closer down the line, I'm going to work with him about getting a guest. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm going to try to get him to uh, maybe have Joe Thon, the manager, talk to us. But uh, Dickie Thon's we'll son? Yeah, yeah Dickie Thon's son, yeah. And then I did email him about a discount. They do give for groups over 20 a $5 discount, so maybe it's only $63, but it's still going to be like just under 70 bucks in Carpus. So, yeah. So we've never done us a chapter. I wanted to go on Thursdays, which is uh, Honey Biscuit Day. They wear their Whataburger uniform. Well, you're welcome to go early if you want, Mike. Saturday <laughs> sounds good to me. Saturday, August 31st. Okay. So that's about it. That's all we got. So okay, we'll get a little time, but they do want to deposit, so we need to. We need to have your uh, decision if you'd like to participate because we have to have 20 people to get to this guy. Well, it's March. We're going to September 1st. I know. They want some money right away. Yeah, no, they always do. But they're not <laughs> sold, I guarantee you they're not soon. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you can negotiate that. Yeah. What, when the, the money may be due. We do that with the Astros. Okay. Uh, two more things. Uh, wrap this thing up. Uh, one, real quick. <clears throat> Vintage baseball. We're trying to revive our vintage baseball team. We've had one for 10 years, and uh, we had to discontinue the program several years ago because of the health situation. And there are a number of people have said they'd like to get back into and play for with our team. We played by 1820 rules, 1860 rules, excuse me. And we've been invited to our first tournament at the George Ranch, a place where we played for years and years. It, it, it's an exciting day. It's uh, Texan rodeo days or Texan 
a special ceremony that they have out there. We open up the ranch to all kind of cowboy activities, all that kind of stuff. We need a manager. We've got eight people who have played with us in the past who would like to participate. And I guess our longest term participant is uh, Bob Stevens over there. He's got some longevity. He played with us about for the first day. And uh, he says he wants to play. <laughs> but we do yeah. need some young folks, too. Uh, most of the people who have agreed to uh, play are 60 or above. Now, they play softball a lot, and they're decent both ball players. The only problem is in, in vintage baseball, first base is 90 feet away, <laughs> not 60 feet away like softball. Oh. And we've had a couple guys who passed out, running out of the double. Pass out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Matt Math's been to some of our games, and Marty's been to some of our games. You might have to pass out honey biscuits before you There you go. Good idea. So we want some volunteers uh, to be a manager and to play. And if you get hold of Mike or myself, uh, we can manage, work out the details. We have uniforms. We have uniforms. We have equipment. We have bats. We have balls over there. And, it, and it's a fun thing. We play seven innings. <laughs> if we can get through seven innings. And uh, a lot of fun. And the game to run relatively close um, score-wise. You know, maybe four to three or seven to six. It's not like you know, 22 to nothing. You have to bring your own glove. No oh. gloves. <laughs> there, isn't it somewhat? there are no gloves. Yeah. There's special names for all the players. Yeah. Like, like, the umpire's called a behind. Behind the top. The catcher is called a behind. Anyway, it's a fun game, and I think you'll enjoy it. Nothing else. Got the cheering voice. Yeah. Okay. So, also, be humiliating. Yeah. I went into the sixth inning one game. I wasn't playing no play, but everybody got tired. And I went out to the first guy, I popped one of it, shortstop dropped it, and boom. I got a hit. Like seven guys in a row got on through hit or an error. And he finally got it out. Bill McCurdy goes, Akrosky, congratulations. We've got an ERA. <laughs> so it is fun and uh, good fellowship. Uh, last but not least, we have our distinguished statistician has the trivia contest. Wait, right, I have some more report. One more report. Oh, you have another report? Yes. <laughs> He told you to talk. You told me I have to talk later. You've chat already. Uh, I think we all have seen the uh, Saints of Second Chances on Netflix. It's called The Saint of Second Chances. I, I saw it last week while I was in Minnesota. It was really terrific. It starts off about Bill Zach, but it's really about Mike Beck, his son, and family. That's what it's about. Uh, Told Chris wanted to get see if he could get three little shorts out of it. Labor meeting. I only remember two of them. So, uh, but it starts off the big thing is how proud he was to work with his dad and all the innovation he did. They did it the luxury suite. And then they had disco night. Disco night. <laughs> Anybody that bought this? Oh. If it's the only disco, yeah. And he's the one that brings it up, Mike Bay. You got in free with the disco record, and they blew it up. <laughs> they risked it out. Between a double header, they were expecting 30,000 people. They had over 100,000 people showed up. There was traffic jam for like seven miles, people trying to get in the city. <laughs> and then they had a riot. And the, number they <laughs> the middle of the game, and they had the middle of the field. Between games, yeah. Police, the uh, riot squad was called and they arrested a couple of people and they forfeited the second game. <laughs> but uh, like that, never lived this down. In the next 20 years, he, just, he got divorced, he stayed drunk, he moved to Miami, had a drug problem, and was in the music story. But he, like this because, because his dad lost his team the next year, so he lost his job. But because of Disco Night, he could never get back to baseball. So, I mean, he loved baseball. 
But he finally got a call in like 1993. Coincidentally, I was in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the St. Paul Saints. And he started promoting them there. That was his second chance. Independent team. Yeah, the independent. It was in the, I think it was the same league, the Skeeters. Yes. And anyway, he, he starts selling them out. They sell out for three or four years, but they're just doing everything to the fan. I mean, they've got to play out there. Like the Savannah Bananas on all the stuff. They were playing baseball. And he wound up buying several more teams. But the part I liked, he also had a guy, you know, his dad's the one that put Eddie no. Fidel in the back. Right. He had a guy on the team with no legs. Oh, okay. oh and, right. and he was in the movie. And big thing was stumps. <laughs> and they were showing Donald and that with no legs. That's all. He's in uniform, and when they would interview him, you could tell he didn't have any legs because he's mad. He's very articulate, pretty intelligent guy. But uh, there comes a part in the movie where Daryl Strawberry has gone through all this drug stuff, and uh, he's trying to get a second chance at baseball. And he's found religion, he's quit the drugs, and nobody will give him a job. Y'all remember Strawberry in his heyday. I was just trying to, there's a few, been a lot of Astro games, but there's a few things that stick out in my mind. And one of them was Strawberry coming up to late innings in 86, bases loaded. And they bring in Frank DePino. Y'all don't remember Frank DePino. He was a left hander. And he kept getting worse as the season went on. <laughs> he was just like batting practice when he went in. They brought him. Sold out, and they brought him in to pitch the strawberry, and everybody's expecting a home run. Why the Pino? But the Pino strikes him out. But there's no cheers. You just hear 40,000 people go, explosion in the air. I've heard anything like that in baseball game. Everybody was just holding their breath. But anyway, strawberry turns out to be a pretty good guy. Mike Beck says no. He's got too much to pay. Mike says, oh, you're telling me no. She won't speak to you. So he called back and he hired me. And he, he, baseball becomes fun. And he bonds with this guy, which is legs. There's a lot of uh, shots of them standing next to each other and playing pitch and strawberry touching on the head and laughing and talking. That part was really pretty emotional. And then there's a game, and Strawberry said, I found my love for baseball again. It was fun. And there's one game where he hits three home runs in a row. <laughs> he got a chance to hit four, you know, tie some kind of minor league record, or maybe he'd be the first guy in the Eastern League. <laughs> but he tells the manager, no, let him pinch it for them. The guy with no legs goes up to bat. <laughs> and it's his only bat he has. Guy with no legs is talking about it. He said, I tiled off four or five pitches. It was just a thrill for him because he never got it. The strawberry gave up this chance for him. The guy struck the guy. I knew it was there when I took it off. <laughs> but, you know, but I got to bat in a professional game. He did the last quarter. Yep. Just like Tiger. Uh, <laughs> anyway, later, strawberry gets called up. That's 96. Yankees win the world championship. He's on the world wow. championship. Team. So there's, there's a lot of stuff like that. It's a really good baseball story. And I forget, what was the other part? That's the two parts I remember. There's three daughter. The daughter. Oh, yeah. Oh. So his daughter was kind of the team mascot. He started going blind, so he oh. takes time off, and goes to 30 states. I think my daughter is a bunch of states too. Turns out she has some kind of rare disease and the blindness is just the first part. And she wound up dying in 27. And she was just, she was kind of his mini me. And that part was pretty poignant. But anyway, it's a great movie. It's called the, what did I say? It was the Saints. Saints, yeah. Because he, he winds up going back to the Saints. And uh, I think you may have been the one that came out with um, 
the uh, Castro the Grouch, where there's the guy banging the garbage can lid uh, a few years ago that the Saints put out. What's the name of it? Uh, the Saint of Second Chances. Saint? Saint. 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 Yeah, it's the Saint Paul Saints. Oh, that's where they get their names. Anyway, it's, it's a real good watch. Sure. Well, a lot of us got to see Mike back at the convention last year, and he was hysterical. Very good speaker. So it could be next year, Minnesota. He said, I'm saying, be my friend. Be my friend. Okay, Phil. All right. Please. Um, courtesy of, of our esteemed leader here, we have our gift for tonight for the winner of the contest. I can't tell. I tell. Okay, thank you, Tal. Um, so, and I think in honor of this, it's probably Obigio since it's the day after St. Patrick's Day. I think. <laughs> so, okay. Um, anyway, so I've got, uh, I hope I have enough copies of this. I ran up a bunch, so please grab one. So the theme for tonight is Major League Baseball managers, some facts about them, and um, uh, with that. So the, and actually, Bill Brown actually gave you one of the answers. He didn't know he was going to do that, but he gave you one of the answers in tonight's uh, contest. So see if you are listening well and know where it came from. Okay. So did you break this? No. <laughs> well, Grant, the uh, Snaps. I have one. Oh, Mark. You have to pay the thing. Okay, great. All right. A lot of these have some ties to our local team. Not all of them do, but a lot of them have some local ties. Anybody need one? I might need a 10 night. Rick, can you hear me? I don't think you Okay, so there's a total of 35 uh, possible points here to get, all right? So, first one, our esteemed uh, former leader of the Astros, Bill Burden, uh, was the first manager to win the postseason. What are the other three Major League Baseball teams that Bill Burden manage? Thanks. All right. Uh, number two, the Blue Jays began playing in the major leagues, I think, in 1976 or 77. Who managed them their first season? I believe he also managed briefly in the Astros Farm System. Look at him. The Astros, number three, have had several former players manage the team. Who was the first former Houston player to manage the Houston franchise? Houston Major League player demands the Houston Major League franchise. So, all right. Number four. What is Sparky Anderson's real first name? Ken, it's not Sparky. His parents like him a little more than that. So, all right. Number five. What team was Sparky Anderson the coach for when he was hired by the Cincinnati Reds in 1970? So, that's the Number six, who was fired by the Detroit Tigers as manager to make way for Sparky Anderson when he came to Detroit? Number seven, this was a big deal then. It's not so much a big deal now. But who was the former Astros manager? who is known for having individual signals for each player, not just like for punt, but he had a fun sign for every player on the team that was different. So the play, so no one could steal the signs. He was actually third base coach for a bunch of teams in the major leagues, but he was a very good one for that. Walter Olson, one of the most famous managers around, uh, Hall of Famer as well. He got a total of one at bat in one season. That was an entire major league career. What team did he play for? Yeah. Where are you going to college? Why did that deal? Somebody's in Ohio. Yes. I can't. Ohio, Ohio. Okay. Ohio, Ohio. Ohio. Okay, the cranial coaches right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up. Who was the last playing manager in the American League? Pete Rose is the last playing manager across baseball. Who was the last one in the American League? 
right? And speaking of, I'll apply this one to my radar number 10. Lou Boudreau was the play manager for the Cleveland Indians for nearly a decade. What other team did Lou Boudreau manage? Bobby Cox, known for having a little bit of fiery temper, the all-time leader in getting ejected from baseball games as a manager. What was the most times he was ever ejected in a single season? Okay. A.J. Hinch, we remember him from being here, obviously. What's his given first from middle names? Hint, it's not A.J. So, I don't know. And, continuing with that thing, what team did he manage before coming to the Astros? Actually, yeah. <laughs> How many different tours of duty did Billy Martin have <laughs> as manager of the Yankees? They had kind of had a he kind of had that revolving door thing going on there. So. And name the other four franchises that Billy Martin managed. Major League, Major League, or all total? Uh, all, all Major League, Major League, because he had he had five total bench, five teams: the Yankees, and you know, as a bench or two. So, and going back to the Cincinnati Reds, and I wish I, I can think about this when I was putting this together. What? Um, who replaced Sparky as manager of the Reds? Okay, Mets third base coach Bobby Valentine took over the managing managerial job of the Texas Rangers in I think in '85 ish around there. In what city were the Texas? Or excuse me, were the New York Mets playing when he took that job? I'll explain to you when we get to the answers a little bit about that. Okay. Back in the early 1960s, the Cubs tried this theory, which was called the, uh, the College of Coaches. Their last season of doing it, uh, I believe it was 1961, was there any, all four managers, if you can, people who managed the games in the College of uh, Coaches for the Cubs? Well, that's it. <laughs> Bill Redney, one of the most famous managers, managed, I think, 18, 18 seasons in the major leagues. What was his postseason record? <laughs> 18 years was the postseason record. Who was the only former Astro player to manage the Colorado Rockies? A former Ranger manager had a misgiving and resigned after only one game managing the team. Who be that? This former Rangers manager replaced Cal Ripken at shortstop, ending a streak of 8,264 consecutive innings. Who is he? This former Rangers manager, a former Rangers manager, Jeff Bannister, a U of H product, also had only one career bat, kind of like Walter Alston. He got it as a pinch hitter. Who was he pinch hitting for? Has a local connection. Okay. And who was manager of the Giants when they moved from New York to San Francisco? And finally, on the 1980 playoff team, there are three future major league managers from the Astros team in 1980. Who are they? I like to hear size. That's always a good sign. Most well, so of this was before I was born. So. <laughs> Some of us before I was born, too. So, <laughs> so give you guys another minute or so to, to work through that, and then we'll go through the answers. Still need more time? Are we, how are we doing? I can't go. Still, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. oh, I Let me know when we're good. Thank we're you giving up one or the other. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. First. Go.
Good, good, good. Or let's go one more time. More time. More time. Okay. I'm not going to pick one on Zoom. I'll trade or something. I'll pick one more. Okay. Right now. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's go. All right. All right. So grade your papers here. Question number one. What teams did Phil Burton manage besides the Astros? Montreal, the Pirates, and the Yankees. Who was the first manager of the Toronto Blue Jays? Roy. Hartsfield. Anybody get that one? <laughs> Yay! All right. I think he also managed, I think, in eight ball for the Astros uh, one season someplace. Before. What's his name? Roy Hartsfield. Oh. Who was the first former Astros player to manage the team? The Bart. Flea, Bob Willis. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what is Sparky Anderson's given first name? George. Okay, this was the question that Brownie gave you guys. What team did Sparky coach for? He was the third base coach of the Padres in 1969. The expansions team. Who was uh, did, uh, replaced? Uh, who did Sparky replace? Former Astros pitching coach Les Moss who was the manager of the Tigers. Hmm. And who was the third base coach with all the funny signals? Preston Gomez managed for the Astros. What team did Walter Alston play for? Cardinals. The Cardinals. There you go. Who was the last playing manager in the American League? Frank Rogers. No. Joe yes. Gordon. Who? Joe Gordon. No. It is Don Kessinger. Oh, Gray oh. Scrambo. Oh, wow. Well, that's what other team besides the Indians? Uh, Red, Sox. Red, Sox. Red Sox. His playing manager with the Red Sox. The most times Bobby Cox never ejected in a season was 11. What does AJ stand for? Alvin John. John. Andrew J. James. Oh, damn it. Do I get three quarters credit? Right? You can have one and a half there. Andrew J. James. I had to look that up to make sure I knew what to look I had Alvin James. I just missed it. So, what team did he manage before he came to Houston? Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks. There we go. How many tours did he did? Billy Mark had? Five is the number. And what other teams did he match? Detroit. Detroit. Oh, Texas. Oakland. Texas. Oakland. Minnesota. 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 What were they again? Detroit. Yeah, Detroit. Detroit. Oakland. Minnesota. Minnesota. Oakland. And the Rangers. Yes. Oh. Who replaced Sparky as manager of the Reds? Vanilla? No. John McNamara. Johnny Mack. Yes. Okay, this, this question, this is a personal one for me. Bobby Valentine was named manager of the uh, the Rangers while they were in Houston. He had flown up there in the morning to interview with the team. He came back that night and to manage his third base coach that night for the Mets here. Afterwards, the Mets were leaving town. I took Bobby Valentine back to the Shamrock Hilton after the game because he gave me an interview there. And and so I was able to get some quotes from him to sell to the media, that to sell to CBS and a couple other people. So I actually took him back to the hotel. He flew to Dallas the next morning and became a manager. They had a press conference in the club. So <laughs> that's the first one that one made. Okay. Anybody get this the College of Coaches? Yeah. Bob Jones. Who? Like yeah. well, Kitty or something like that. Elliot uh, Tappy. Yeah. Yeah. Harry Kraft was in the 1961 group. B.D. Hemsel, I've never heard of him before in my life. And Lou Klein. Lou Klein. Maybe. What were the last two? Uh, B.D. Hemsel 
and Lou Klein. Did they finish last? Uh, they pretty uh, in sixty one. They probably did. <laughs> Bill Rigney managed eighteen seasons. His postseason record: zero and three. He never made it to the World Series. The only team he ever managed to the playoffs was the Minnesota uh, Twins. I think in like right after uh, 60, Blake Martin was there. Sixty nine. Sixty nine or seven. Who was the former player to manage the Colorado Rockies? The former Astro. Mm -hmm. Buddy Bell. Oh, wow. Buddy Bell. Bell. Hey, the one game with the Rangers. Penny Stanky. Penny Stanky. That's it. All right. The former uh, Rangers manager who replaced Cal Ripken in shortstop. Anybody? He also played for the Astros. That's what Ronald Washington. Yes, not an, it, it wasn't the guy who came in after he stopped the inning streak. So the key on that one. Okay, Jeff Bannister had that one career pinch hit, which he got a single in. He hit it against an old uh, person from the University of Houston as well. He pinched it for Doug Drabeck. So, local, local connection there. All right, home stretch here. Who was the manager when the Giants moved from New York to San Francisco? Rigby. Bill Rigby. And the three future Astros, or three future major league managers on the 1980s. Bochy. Bochy. Uh, no, nope. Garner was not here. Garner was not here yet. No. Nope. Louis Pujols. He managed the Detroit Tigers for almost a full season in, uh, I think, 2002. Louis Pujols. Louis Pujols. Bill Garner got fired. Uh, yeah, that was. Yeah, about six games. Like, that was the year they fired tons of managers. Everybody got fired that year. So, all right, so those are five. Okay, five, three. They are Art Howe, Bruce Bochy, and Louis Pools. Okay, so let's see who the winner is and get to this next month. Those who have five correct answers. All right. Uh, Try 10 correct answers. Okay, so we're down to two. Uh, 12? 12? 10? I did not make the name, sir. 10? 11. How many do you have? Traffic piece. Why don't we find I've done this one? So good. I've done it a lot. So do you have a. You won the eleven, or did you just? I didn't you know. You won't find out the best. There's a book in hand. Yeah, it's not right. Hey, thank you. Hey, please. That's. All right. I think I counted thirty-nine people counting the Zoom. That's a number I got. It's a pretty good number. That's 39 people. That's great. Okay. Uh, what's the date of the next meeting? I know Mike Vance is going to be our speaker at the next meeting. I'm not sure of the date. It's going to be on Monday. Yes. April 20th. Today, April 22nd. April 22nd. Our uh, second? It's April 22nd. Mike Vance. Okay. April 22nd. Thank you all for coming. It's been great. Take care. Thank you, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, Bob. How you doing, Tal? <laughs>